Okay, so I am here in Boston instead of in Pittsburgh, but we got to continue with complexity theory. So this is lecture nine. And it's about time space trade offs for SAT. Now, of course, the P versus MP problem is very hard to resolve. We don't expect to do so anytime soon. But what about something maybe a little bit simpler, like how about NP versus L, logarithmic space? Now, this is uh, super unlikely. It's uh, to be uh, equal. This is equivalent to the question of whether or not the SAT problem is uh, solvable in log n space. So since this is even more unlikely than SAT equals P, hopefully we have a better chance of proving it. Well, this is still hard, but uh, let's see if we can prove anything along these lines. So there's a pretty cool uh, result that's sort of arguably in the direction of these lines. Uh, this result, uh, the latest one in this line of work, is due to Ryan Williams, and in fact it formed the basis of his 2007 CMU PhD thesis. And he showed the following fact. Let's say you have a SAT algorithm that uh, uses logarithmic space. Okay, it's very unlikely to exist, but if it does exist, then um, it needs at least uh, n to the 1.8 time. Okay. Well, a dream scenario would be to show that a SAT algorithm, you know, that uses log n space needs n squared time and n cubed time and n to the 100 time, and in fact, you know, uh, more than any polynomial amount of time, but at least we got n to the 1.8 time. And let me make a few comments about uh, this. This is uh, working under the assumption that you have a very low space algorithm. Uh, but log n is actually not important, so this log n can actually be um, any n to the little o of 1. In fact, if you're you know, careful about things and you're willing to you know, lose a little on the n to the 1.8, uh, this could even be n to the 0. 0.0000 many zeros followed by 1. Okay, so um, n to a very small constant. Now, what's the deal with this uh, 1.8? Uh, well, actually, this can be any number that's less than uh, 2 cos pi over 7. That's a number that's slightly bigger than 1.8. Uh, that's just a funny way of uh, phrasing it. Uh, if you really look at the proof, then where this number comes from is it's just the solution of this equation, uh, c cubed minus c squared minus 2c plus 1 equals 0. Okay, so that little cubic equation comes up somewhere in Williams's work, and that's where the funny number comes from. And the last comment I wanted to make about this theorem is that uh, this is even um, in the computational model of RAMs, so random access Turing machines. Okay, so normally we've defined our Turing machines with uh, multi-tape Turing machines, but this lower bound says that even in a, a RAM, a random access machine, if you use a little n to the low of one space to try to solve SAT, then you're going to need at least n to the 1.8 time. Okay, and I'll comment a little bit uh, later on why that's particularly important to have that observation. But let me first introduce a little notation that will help us out during this lecture. Uh, so we're going to be talking a lot in this lecture about um, algorithms that simultaneously run in small time and small space. So we're going to introduce this notation, TISP, that stands for time and space. Maybe I'll just call it TISP, we'll see. Um, okay, so TISP, T of N, comma S of N. Okay, is all those languages decidable um, by an algorithm? And let's, as I said, even allow random access Turing machines, so they're decidable by a RAM Turing machine, uh, running in time order T of n, and space order S of n, and that's simultaneously. Okay. So this notation, TISP, will help us talk about algorithms that are simultaneously low in space and low in time. Okay, so to another way to state uh, Williams's result um, from 07 is that the SAT problem is not in the class, uh, the class, the time space class, n to the 1.8, and let's say n to the little of 1. Okay, think of that as like 
n to the point zero 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 one or poly log n or some small factor of n. Let me tell you a little bit about the history of the result. This result by Williams is actually the combination combination of a long line of work on time space trade offs for SAT. And this work uh, kind of originally dated back to work by Conan in 84, and then it was sort of revived by Fortnow in 97. Um, Lipton and Viglis in 99 proved a pretty cool result that we'll see first in this lecture. They kind of got this result, uh, but with n to the 1.4 instead of n to the 1.8. And then uh, Fortnow and Van Malkabeek improved that. And then Williams improved that in 05. And then um, Thiel and Val Malkabeek improved this in 06. And Williams finally got this uh, 2 close pi over 7 result in 2007. And honestly, there might be some more papers in there that I'm missing, but there was a, a long line of work along uh, these lines. So let me mention a couple of highlights here, um, in particular a couple of the results that we'll see in this lecture. So this Lipton and Viglis result, they show that a SAT cannot be solved in the time-space class n to the 1.414 or so, uh, and n to the little of 1. Okay, so any um, low space algorithm for SAT, uh, subpolynomial space algorithm for SAT requires at least n to the 1.414 time. And what is this 1.414? Well, it's just any number that's less than the square root of 2. That's not a 2. Here's a 2. That's better. And uh, let me mention what uh, this Fortnow van Malkovich result did. Uh, it was similar, but they showed that SAT is not in the time space class n to the 1.618 with the sub polynomial amount of space. And what is 1.618? Well, it's anything less than phi, the golden ratio. And what about this result of Williams 05? I mention it because we'll also prove uh, this result of his in class. He got it up to about, uh, let me just write, n to the 1.66. That's a time lower bound for uh, low space SAT algorithms. And what is this 1.66? Uh, it's 2 to the 1 quarter times 3 to the 1 eighth times uh, 4 to the 1 16th times 5 to the 1 over 32 times dot dot dot, etc. So uh, a lot of funny numbers come up in this work. And as we saw, this last one by Williams in 2007 had this 1.8, which was actually 2 times cos pi over 7. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to first show you this square root 2 result. And then we'll extend it and get this 1.66 result. And we won't get as far as the 1.8 result, but you'll get the gist of how these things uh, go. Okay. So uh, let me make a couple of remarks before we get down into it, a few um, slightly technical remarks. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're even going to work in the RAM Turing machine model for this lecture. Uh, show that SAT uh, requires this amount of time even on RAMs, not just multi tapering machines. And it's actually Im quite important that you make this remark. Uh, the reason for that is if you're just working the multi tape Turing machine uh, model, then in fact, uh, notably better results were proved sort of even as early as the 60s. So um, Cobham in 1966 and, you know, uh, sort of put together with Santanum in 2001, they sort of collectively observed that the palindromes problem, uh, and also Santanum extended to the SAT problem, um, cannot be solved by a low space machine in time anything less than quadratic, n to the 2 minus little of 1, uh, assuming n to the little of 1 space. And if you look at that, it looks much better than all this like hardworking list of results, n to the 1.4, n to the 1.6, n to the 1.8, etc. But the downside of these results is that they are just for multi-tape Turing machines. And they don't seem to hold for the RAM model. And that's a shame because the RAM model is actually the most popular model for actual algorithms research. And the fact that this uh, result about palindromes requiring quadratic time if you have sub-polynomial space, um, 
the fact that it only holds for the multi-tape Turing machine model is because somehow it really exploits the fact that multi-tape Turing machines, you know, don't have random access memory. They have to like still move their heads sequentially up and down on tapes and so forth. So it's really, in some sense, exploiting uh, quarks of the Turing machine model. Whereas we like to think that if you have a, a result, like the ones we'll talk about today, that holds not just for multi-tape Turing machines, but also on the RAM model, then it's really about um, computation as opposed to some quirk of the model. Um, okay, let me make even further um, technical remarks about the RAM model. I'll just say these quickly in words uh, because I don't want to dwell on it too much. Um, but we have to ask yourselves, uh, ourselves a little bit, what does it mean uh, space complexity on the RAM model? Um, because let's say you're a, a RAM Turing machine and you run in, uh, I don't know, n squared time. Then you remember the RAM model, you have like index tapes and the random access tapes. And so on the index tape, you write the address of some uh, memory cell on the random access tape. And then in one step, you can read or write to that cell. So if you run an n squared time on a RAM, then you can write down like an address that's like n squared bits long and therefore access, you know, memory cell number two to the n squared. That looks a little bit unenjoyable. Um, we like to think that n squared time machines should only use n squared space. And it's true that they can only access, you know, n squared different um, memory cells. Um, but it would be nicer if those memory cells were, you know, memory cells numbers one through n squared, as opposed to some random collection of memory cells uh, that could be as large as two to the n squared. That seems funny. Uh, however, uh, we can get back to a more uh, relaxing scenario where the algorithm does not access ridiculously large memory cell locations um, just through the use of a little bit of data structures. So in fact, if you have any um, RAM Turing machine, um, you can slightly alter it so it you know, uses a dictionary data structure to st store and access all its um, access as memory. Oh, I have a lot of S's in the word access there. Let me cross one out. Um, you can use a dictionary data structure and thereby just use the first, you know, if, if your machine uses uh, S tape cells, you can ensure that it's the first order S tape cells and not some random high scattered collection of ones just by using a dictionary data structure. And this only costs you a logarithmic factor in your running time. I don't know if you use balanced binary search trees or something. Okay, so everything I'm going to talk about today, a log factor in the running time is going to be the least of our worries. It's not a big deal. So uh, we can assume that our RAM Turing machines, you know, if they use S space, they just use the first order S uh, cells on their uh, RAM tape. Okay. And what's nice about that is then that, um, you know, we have a nice notion of the configuration for a RAM Turing machine. It's just the first uh, space many memory cells plus the head locations and the Turing machine state, as we like to have in uh, tape-based Turing machines. Okay, so uh, that was some blah 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 about RAMs. And now let me make a few more remarks before we get down to it. Um, we're going to actually prove statements that's not that are not quite about SAT per se. We're going to prove statements like the following. They'll look like uh, statements about non-deterministic time n. Okay, and what we're going to show is something like you know non-deterministic time n is not contained in uh, let's say the time space class n to the 1.41 and maybe space n to the some little amount. Let me even write some explicit number here n to the 0.021. Okay, so that'll be like a typical statement we'll prove. Now, I promised you at the beginning of this that we'll be talking about lower bounds for SAT. So what does this statement about non-deterministic linear time have to do with SAT? Well, if you recall back to lecture six, we proved in lecture six that um, the SAT problem is complete for non-deterministic quasi-linear time. Okay, so not only can it be solved in uh, quasi-linear, non-deterministic quasi-linear time, on a RAM Turing machine, it's complete for it. So um, basically every problem in non-deterministic quasi-linear time has a quasi-linear time reduction to SAT. Okay, so it's essentially um, the hardest problem in non-deterministic quasi-linear time. Um, in particular, somehow non-deterministic time 
n, which is what we'll be reasoning about, is not really stronger than sat. I should also mention that, uh, as I pointed out last time in lecture six, actually most, quote unquote, most natural um, NP-complete problems, you know, your favorite ones, whatever, max cut or, um, you know, three coloring, are also uh, NQL complete. So even though we'll talk about, you know, time space lower bounds for SAT in this lecture, they apply to, you know, most of your favorite NP-complete problems. I should say most natural NP-complete problems. Okay, so uh, as I said, because SAT is uh, NQL complete, what can we conclude? Well, it, what we conclude is that this statement star about non-deterministic linear time implies that, um, let's say SAT is not in, we just have to take this time space class and divide everything by like some polylogs, okay? Because we have this super efficient reduction from uh, non-deterministic time N to SAT that we saw in lecture six, uh, okay, so it only causes polylog blowups here uh, when you reduce n time n to sat. Okay, so if we're you know, particularly lazy, we can just say, well, I'll I'll take a shave a little bit off of my polynomial factors here and call this n to the 1.4. Oops, call this n to the 1.4, and uh, this n to the 0.021. I'll just round it down to n to the 0.02, and that's the kind of conclusion we'll get. Okay. So um, now I think I've said all the technicalities that I want to say, and we'll get into proving statements that look like this. And as you see, this will give us basically the same looking um, lower bounds for small space algorithms for SAT, even on RAM Turing machines. Okay, so how are we going to prove theorems like this statement about non-deterministic time n? not being in the time space class n to the 1.4 comma n to the 0.02. Well, there are a few ingredients, so let me tell you about the ingredients we'll use in these theorems. Okay, ingredient number one is something that I'll call, following uh, Williams, the no complementary speed up theorem. And this theorem is kind of like a time hierarchy theorem for the alternating uh, time complexity classes. And in fact, I mentioned on Piazza. So um, it says the following, let's say you have the sigma k time class T of n, then it is not contained in pi k time, anything smaller than T of n. Okay, and I suppose T of n has to be time constructible here. And this is for k at least one. Okay, so it says that if you have, let's say, I don't know, uh, non-deterministic time T of n, it's not contained in co-non-deterministic time, anything significantly smaller than T of n. Okay, or sigma two is not, cannot be converted to pi two and sped up at the same time. Now, as I uh, mentioned when we talked about the, um, the alternating time Turing machines, there's actually a time hierarchy theorem for any of them saying something like sigma k time T of n is not contained in sigma k time uh, oh, little o of t of n. Okay, so the maybe the first thing you would think of in terms of a time hierarchy theorem for uh, the alternating Turing machine classes. And you can prove this time hierarchy theorem in the exact same way you prove the non-deterministic time hierarchy theorem. The proof is basically identical. But this no complementary speed up theorem is a little bit different. It's comparing sigma k, sigma k time to pi k time and the converse, of course. And in fact, as I said on Piazza, it's actually much easier to prove than the time hierarchy theorem for sigma k time. In fact, to prove it, you just do the normal proof of the time hierarchy theorem. Remember, the difficulty when you start mixing time hierarchy theorem with um, non-determinism seems to be that you want the, the big complexity, the big time complexity class to simulate, let me erase this one down here, to simulate the smaller time class and also reverse the answer. Okay, and if you're deterministic, reversing the answer is no problem. If you're not deterministic uh, and you're trying to simulate non-deterministic class and reverse the answer, well, that's difficult and you need lots of tricks. But if you're trying to simulate a pi k computation and reverse the answer and you're a sigma k machine, then you're loving life, it's no problem. So in fact, this, this proof of a no complementary speed up theorem um, that you can't speed up Turing machines by switching sigma k computations to pi k computations it's very easy to prove. It's just the same proof as the time hierarchy theorem. 
OK, uh, Windows is telling me something. I'll say maybe later. Uh, OK, the next ingredient is a very simple ingredient, padding. I'm not going to make a big deal about padding. I'll use it in a few times. Hopefully you remember how padding works. It was a key player in homework number one, problem three. OK, third ingredient that we're going to need. This is the real key player, the main cool trick in these proofs is an agreement that I'll call uh, trading uh, alternations for time, or maybe time for alteration, alternations. Okay, so in other words, this is a trick about how you can take a, an algorithm and speed it up significantly if you're allowing yourself the use of a few alternations, you know, if you're willing to go to sigma two time instead of good old deterministic time. This idea for this trick is apparently due to uh, Nepom from 1970. And here's an example uh, theorem in this uh, ingredient class. So there's a couple of variations, but a simple one uh, is this theorem that we'll see a proof of. Uh, let's say you have the time space class uh, T comma S. Then this is contained in uh, sigma two time uh, square root T square root S. Okay, uh, and of course TNS should be time constructible and space constructible. And it's kind of useful, for example, to think of uh, this little s parameter as n to the little of one, as we always do. Or maybe I should say t to the little of one, although all our t's will just be polynomial in n. And then this is kind of saying that, um, oops, there should be a slash here. Whoops, there should not be a slash here. So I'm getting mixed around. Uh, this is a positive result. Uh, low space and low time computations can be simulated by sigma two time, which is much smaller than uh, the basic time. As I was saying, um, time space uh, t comma t to the little of one, you can think of this as being contained in sigma two time, basically root t. Okay, again, plus little of one. Okay, that's some bad notation there. Um, let me also add that I put sigma two time here, but I could have also put, let me scratch this out, I could have equally well put pi two time here. And that's because this class on the left, the time space class is closed under complement. It's a deterministic class, so uh, it's closed under complement. So we can also complement the right hand side and still get a theorem. So that will switch the sigma two to a pi two. So we're gonna use that fact that in fact, uh, we can put we can speed up deterministic computation, which uses small space, either to sigma two or to pi two, and we'll save some uh, square roots. So in fact, let me just show you the proof of this particular version of the theorem. It's not too hard. Okay, so let's think about how to prove this. Let's say we have a, a machine, a regular, well, in fact, it'll be a, a RAM Turing machine, but you know, a regular deterministic computation that uses time t and space s. So it has some uh, tableau, a computation tableau that stores all its uh, work tape and I guess index tapes as well. Basically, we have a computation tableau as we often think about in complexity theory. And uh, one fact about this tableau is we think of it as quite narrow because we have a uh, small space machine, I suppose I should say order s, and uh, it's order t times, so that's the height of the tableau. Okay, and recall that the tableau just stores, you know, the configuration of the Turing machine at each time step. Okay, so we have order t configurations because there's t time, and um, each configuration uses order s space, okay, because we have a space s machine and uh, adding in the, the index tapes and the tape head locations and so forth and so on in the Turing machine state, there's not much more time. Okay, so any time space ts machine has a tableau that looks like this and we want to simulate, you know, the point of this theorem is we want to simulate such a machine by a uh, sigma two machine with much less time. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? 
Well, the idea is rather like um, Savage's theorem and other theorems of that ilk in complexity theory. Uh, so here's how it's going to go. So remember, a sigma two machine starts out with existential guessing. Okay, so it existentially guesses. And what it's going to guess are some of the configurations of this machine periodically. So it's going to guess the following configurations. It's going to con guess configuration CR and C2R and C3R and so forth, where R is some parameter. Okay, so it's going to guess every Rth configuration. Okay, so we'll come back to how much time that takes in a second, but Let's move on to the next step. So it's going to maybe guess this configuration and this configuration and this configuration if these ovals were in every rth position. Okay, so it's the sigma 2 machine. So now it's going to do some universal guessing. So it's actually not going to universally guess that much. It's just going to universally guess an index j um, from 1 up to t over r, where, you know, t over r. It's not very attractively written. T over R is the number of different configurations it guessed. Okay, so it's going to, in some sense, universally try all these configurations it guessed. And the last step of the Sigma 2 machine's uh, algorithm is to deterministically check or verify that, okay, so the meaning of J is, you know, which uh, transition from one guest configuration to another that it's going to check. So it's going to deterministically verify that if it takes its um, J minus one configuration that it guessed, uh, which is C sub J minus one times R, it'll check that that um, yields in this normal sense of deterministic Turing machine computation, the Jth configuration, C sub J R, which it guessed, in our steps, okay? In other words, it's just gonna deterministically simulate the Turing machine starting from configuration C sub J minus one R to configuration C sub J R uh, for our steps, and that's it. Check that it is correct, okay? So uh, the first thing I wanna convince you of, uh, which I think is hopefully clear, is that this is a correct simulation in the sense that when the machine correctly guesses these uh, intermediate configurations, um, then this for all part sort of makes sure that all of the deterministic uh, steps down here have to um, succeed. And so it's sort of gonna check that all of the guesses are correct in the sense that they follow from each other. Okay, and I, I suppose if you guess the first one, you need to check that uh, if j is 1, you need to check that it follows from the initial configuration, uh, which you can do with your random access to the input tape. Um, right, and then the deterministic part is deterministic, so it's it's correctly checks that one configuration leads to another in a certain number of steps. Okay, so that's the algorithm, and now let's just think about how much time it takes. So let's see, uh, how about this existential phase? Well, it's guessing... Um, T over R configurations, and each configuration, and this is a crucial part, is not very large. It's order S bits. Um, so each of the guess configurations is order S bits, so the amount of time to guess all these configurations is order T over R times S. Okay. Uh, the next step is this universal guessing. It's just guessing a number. That's going to be like negligible time compared to everything else, so that's not very much. And the last bit is this deterministic bit. And, you know, you're simulating a Turing machine for our steps. Okay, and um, it's the usual business. Once you have some non-determinism, you can do this with no slowdown at all, just a constant factor slowdown. Um, okay, so this simulation takes order R time. Okay, so the total time, I'll write it down here. The total time for the simulation this sigma two style simulation is order t over r s plus r. Okay, and remember that r is a parameter here. So uh, we just need to balance this parameter. So to balance parameters, the best r to choose is 
what we mentioned, root t root s. Okay, and you see when you choose that, um, this total time becomes order root t root s as promised. Okay, so we indeed did show that the time space class t com s is contained in sigma two time uh, order root t root s. Okay, and again, if you think of s as something subpolynomial, then think of it as uh, root t. Okay, so you can speed up your time by a square root factor as long as you give yourself two more alternations. Oops. Um, good. So that's going to be a key ingredient for all these time space trade off proofs. And uh, let me make one more remark about this. Actually, two more remarks. Uh, the first remark I'll make is just to remind you that, uh, although it's not clear from the proof, it's just a sort of almost automatic syntactic consequence that I could also put pi 2 here, because the left-hand side is closed under complement. The other remark I want to make is that um, it might look a little funny to you that, uh, well, the very small amount of times we're getting here. So for example, um, Suppose I plugged in t to be n and s to be n to the 0.4. I just made those up. So if we applied that, we get that um, any algorithm running in simultaneous uh, linear space and, sorry, linear time and n to the 0.4 space can be simulated by a sigma 2 time, well, a sigma 2 machine um, running in time. Well, we have to compute root n times root of n to the 0.4. That's n to the 0.7. And that might strike you as a little funky. That's actually sublinear time, which we're not normally used to in complexity theory, algorithms that run in sublinear time. We used to usually think that the algorithm has to look at the whole input, for example. But remember, we're working with random access machines here. And so actually, sublinear running times make um, perfect sense. It's quite possible to have sublinear running times on a random access machine. Uh, this makes sense in the RAM model. Nevertheless, actually, if you're kind of still uh, queasy about this, um, and you prefer the multi-tape Turing machine model, then um, this is all true. Uh, you know, it only works if the final target time is at least n, but it doesn't really affect the, the proofs that we're going to do. You can just, um, as you'll eventually see, you can just like pad every polynomial time running time that we generate by some large amounts, and it'll make all the running times large and super linear. So you don't have to worry about sublinear running times. But we will stick with sublinear running times because it makes the arguments cleaner and there's nothing wrong with it. Okay, so with these ingredients in place, the, um, the no complementary, let's go back and look at them, the no complementary speed up, that'll be the final, um, step in our proof. Our proofs are going to be by contradiction, by the way, so we're going to try to prove statements like this red circled one, that non deterministic linear time is not contained in some time space class. The way it'll work is we'll assume, for sake of contradiction, that it's not true, that non-linear, uh, sorry, non deterministic linear time can be simulated in small time and space. And we'll do some padding, and we'll do some trading time for alternations, and we'll do a few other little tricks. And at the end, we'll get a contradiction to this uh, no complementary speed up theorem. We'll get a, a con an inclusion that looks like this. And then we'll say, but that's not true. So we'll get our contradiction. Okay, so that's what we would now like to do. I'll show you the first and simplest form of these uh, time space trade offs for set arguments that use the ingredients we've just seen. Okay, so now we can really get started with proving some theorems. We have all the ingredients we need, and we're ready to go. So uh, the first one I'll show is the most basic one, in some sense, that gives uh, the power of root 2. So it basically shows that sat requires n to the root 2 time if you use uh, subpolynomial or polylog or whatever space. In fact, I'll actually do a version of it where I even you allow you a little bit of a little bit of a polynomial amount of space. So. The theorem I'll prove now is the following. Um, Non-deterministic linear time is not contained in the time-space class uh, with n to the 1.4 time and n to the 0.02 space. Okay, so that shows that sat also requires basically 
n to the 1.4 time if it's given n to the 0.02 space. Okay, so as I said, the way we prove this is by contradiction. So we assume for the sake of contradiction, as these letters say, that n time n is contained in time space class n to the 1.4 comma n to the 0.02. Okay, and this will be our workhorse assumption throughout the proof that we'll eventually use to drive a contradiction. Okay, so now the way I'm going to do this proof, it's going to start out in a slightly magical way. I'm just going to say, let us consider the following complexity class, pi 2 time n. Okay, slightly unmotivated, but as soon as we do that, we're able to get started on the proof. Okay, so what is pi 2 time n? Well, it's one of these uh, time classes defined by alternating Turing machines. So basically, a pi 2 time n machine, what does it do? It, you know, uses some non-determinism, and it starts with making these universal guesses, or these sort of for-all style guesses. Um, this equality here, um, don't take it too seriously, I'm just inventing some notation. Um, and then at some point it alternates and starts making existential style guesses. That goes on for a while. And then it you know, does some deterministic computation at the end. And uh, then it accepts or rejects. Okay. And uh, all this stuff is uh, order n time. And in particular, let me just take a look at this last piece of it starting from the existential guessing. This is uh, an order n time computation, certainly, and it starts with just existential guessing, and that's it. So this is an n time style computation. This is an n time, a linear time computation. Um, and our you know, key assumption here tells us about n time uh, n says that it can be put into this low time space class. In fact, I'm even gonna, for this part of the argument, forget about the space thing, and just remember that n time n, by assumption, is contained in time n to the 1.4. Forget the low space business for now. Okay, so what that means is we can substitute out this, this part of the pi 2 computation with some deterministic computation, albeit one that's n to the 1.4 time, but we've got rid of one alternation in having done this. Okay, so the conclusion of this is that using the assumption, we get that pi 2 time n is a subset of pi 1 time n to the 1.4. Okay, and uh, I'm going to use this R, um, fact later, so let me label it by double dagger. So now we have two things working for us. We have this star, which is an assumption about non-deterministic linear time. And we have this double dagger, which tells us that uh, for a pi 2 computation, we can get rid of one of the alternations, the sigma 1 in the middle, um, at the expense of losing a factor of 1.4 in the time. Great. Well, let's keep going. So this right-hand side here, it looks kind of similar to the, the end time. It's just the, the complement class. So let's actually use the, the complement of what uh, star, our basic assumption, gives us. So I'll write it in this funny way. The, the co of star is that, um, well, n times the same as sigma 1 time. So the co of star is that pi 1 time n is a subset of, well, uh, the complement of the time space class is just itself because that is a deterministic class, so it's closed under complement. So I'll just write the same thing here. Uh, great. So now uh, this is almost looking like this, except when we have linear time, when we have uh, n to the 1.4 time. But if you recall, um, positive results can be uh, shifted upwards via padding. Okay. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that if you just do padding on this last result here, uh, the sort of padding where you replace the input length n by the artificially padded to n to the 1.4 length, then what do you get? Well, you get to plug, uh, replace n with n to the 1.4 everywhere in the statement. So you get that pi 1 time n to the 1.4 is a subset of, now you have to remember how to multiply. So this is n to the 1.4 to the 1.4. So the square of 1.4 is, I guess, 1.96. Suspiciously close to, yet smaller than 2. 
And we also have to do n to the 1.4 in here, so to the power of 0.02, that gives us n to the 0.028 if my calculations are correct. Okay, so that's a very simple uh, padding argument uh, that lets us basically match up this left-hand side with this uh, right-hand side. So I can now take this complexity inclusion that I just proved and use it in double dagger. Um, okay, so what do we now know? Aha, I'll do that in a second, but let me actually continue with this time space class while I have it here. This is gonna be the most big move in the proof. This is where I'm gonna use the alternation trading. Okay, so remember the alternation trading was this cool step that showed us, I'll show it to you. Aha, here we are. That if you have a low time and low space class, especially low space uh, deterministic class, you can get it to be really low time, square root of t squared of s, if you're willing to pay two alterate alternations. And you can pay sigma two or pi two. Uh, we're gonna pay sigma two. Okay, so let's go back down to where we were. We have this time space class here, and we're gonna use alternation trading on it. So this is a subset of sigma two time. I have to do a little bit more arithmetic. We have to take the square root of this, the square root of that, and multiply them together. So let's just write this square root of n to the 1.96, and square root n to the 0 0.028. Okay, I can do this. I did this calculation. Um, that multiplies out to, if I got it right, uh, something just a little bit less than one, n to the 0.994. It's a miracle. Okay, great. So now let's put everything together. We have, uh, I'll use some red here. We started with pi two time n, that's right here. Put it into pi one time n to the 1.4. And then here's pi one time n to the 1.4 again. Um, using the basic assumption, we got this into the time space class. We did the alternation trading. Put that into sigma two time n to the 0.994. So putting it all together, what we've got now is pi two time n is a subset of sigma two time a little bit less than n, n to the 0.994, and that's the contradiction. That's the contradiction to like no complementary speed up. Okay, because we have uh, pi two on the left, sigma two on the right, those are complementary, and we have a slightly smaller time on the right than we do on the left. And that's it, that's the contradiction. Uh, so we're uh, done with the proof. We've shown that non-deterministic time n is not contained in the time space class and to the 1.4 and to the 0 0.02. Okay, so I want to recap the argument we just did, even though we just did it, uh, because of uh, two things. First, I want to just limit our attention to the case where we only allow n to the little o of one space, just so we can focus on trying to get the largest possible time lower bound. And second, I want to sort of write it in as short a way as possible so we could focus on the ingredients that we used in the proof and see if we can sharpen them a little bit to try to improve the proof. So here's how I'd uh, recap the proof that we just saw. So first we assume for the sake of contradiction that n time n is contained in uh, the time space class. And let me just write n to the c for now. We'll try to see how large c can be. And as I said, let me focus on the case of n to the little of one space. Okay, so that was our base assumption. And if you'll recall, the next thing we decided to do was just look at the pi two time class, uh, pi two time n. Okay, and the first thing we did was kind of recognize that pi two time is kind of like for all, and then there exists and time n. And the exist time n part is exactly n time, which is what we have an assumption about. So by sort of sticking our assumption into the uh, second part of the definition of pi two time, and also ignoring the fact that we have n time in a time space class and only using the fact that it's in deterministic time n to the c, we got that pi two time n is a subset of pi one time n to the c. Okay, I'm gonna call this step um, alternation elimination as opposed to alternation trading. And we'll come back to it 
in a little bit after this recap of the proof. Okay, so this was a stage where we uh, got rid of one alternation at the expense of paying some time. Okay, the next step of the proof uh, was as follows. So uh, our assumption is that non-deterministic time n is in a certain time-space class. The time-space class is closed in our complement, so we can get that the, the complement of n time, which is pi 1 time, uh, is also in the same time-space class. Uh, so the assumption is about pi 1 time n. So by padding, we can get it to be about pi 1 time n to the c. So long story short, using the assumption, we put this into the time-space class n to the c squared and n to the low of 1 again. And just to remind you, that was by our basic assumption, actually the, the complement of our basic assumption, and some padding. OK, now the next step was the big step. It's where we use alternation trading to take this low space computation and shave time off it at the expense of adding a couple of quantifiers. So we said that this is a subset of sigma 2 time. And remember, when you have a space n to the little of 1, you basically just get to square root the time. OK, so that's n to the c squared divided by 2. OK, and there's a plus a little of 1 because of the space. And that was by alternation trading, trading uh, time for alternations. And uh, now we're almost done. Well, we, we are done precisely when c squared over 2 is strictly less than 1. So if c squared over 2 is strictly less than 1, we get a contradiction to the no complementary speed up theorem. And that completes the proof that we just saw. And what it shows, of course, this is if and only if c is less than the square root of 2. OK, what it shows is that we get the lower bound that not deterministic time n is not contained in time space n to the c with little o of n to the little of 1 time as long as c is strictly less than root 2, 1.41, 1 etc. OK, and that's the recap. Let me just. Uh, end this recap by asking a question. The question is, suppose we try to execute this whole proof using c equals 1.5. Would we get nothing? Would we be totally dead? Well, we could repeat this proof and we'd get as far as the end right here. And I guess uh, 1.5 squared divided by 2 is 1.125. So we wouldn't get a contradiction to any time hierarchy type theorem. But I want to say that we're not quite dead because, well, at least we have a new fact, namely what we've managed to conclude. I put fact in quotes here because it's probably not a true fact. It's a, it's, it's a consequence of our assumption that we're trying to show is not true by contradiction. But under this assumption, we have a new fact, namely pi 2 time n is a subset of, remember in this case where c is hypothetically 1.5, uh, basically sigma 2 time uh, n to the 1.125, plus a little of 1, I suppose. OK, <clears throat> so uh, you know this isn't a contradiction, but as I said, this is a new fact that we can try to reinsert into more elaborate proofs that kind of look like this, this thing I just put the braces around. We have like a new gadget that we can hopefully stick into this proof and maybe uh, get something more out of. Okay, so before we do that, what I want to do is just um, sharpen the two main tools that we have, or at least revisit the two main tools that we have. Um, so these are alternation elimination. We didn't explicitly talk about that as a tool yet, but we're going to use it a few times, so I want to briefly recap it. And then alternation trading. And this one we can actually make better. So right now we have results about how you can get a square root savings in time for low space machines if you go up to sigma 2 or pi 2. And as we'll see, if you go up to higher levels in the alternating hierarchy, you can get more time saving. OK, so now I want to revisit some of the ingredients that we used in this previous proof so that we can look at them in more detail and improve them a little so that we can get some improved time space trade offs. So the first ingredient that I want to look at in a little bit more detail is what I was calling uh, alternation elimination. Okay, and this is the ingredient that um, uh, actually allows us 
to show that if we do have some kind of complementary, not speed up, but like a way to complement the alternation class we're using without too much slowdown, then we, you can use it to eliminate one alternation uh, in computations. So the hypothesis here is the following. Suppose that we somehow manage to show that, say, sigma k minus 1 time n is a subset of pi k minus 1 time n to the c. So we can switch the sigma k minus 1 to a pi k minus 1 at the expense of n to the c running time. Uh, here, let's say k is a positive integer, and c is some um, number that's at least 1. Okay. Under this assumption, then it's not hard to show that we can eliminate one quantifier, at, again, the expense of a power of c. So for example, then pi time, pi k time, um, let's say t more generally, is a subset of pi k minus 1 time uh, t to the c. So I've kind of combined two things here. I've combined uh, the alternation elimination with padding. Okay, and this is, let's say, for uh, time constructible um, t of n. Okay? So, you know, to prove this, what do we do? We take the, the hypothesis here that sigma k minus 1 time n is a subset of pi k minus 1 time n to the c, pad it up a little bit, so this t of n will always be at least n, being time constructible. So we get the same uh, relationship, but with t and t to the c in these two places. Okay, and then we take a look at this pi k uh, time t computation. It starts with some for all quantification, and then it does a sigma k minus 1 style computation. Okay, so by hypothesis, we can turn that computation into a pi k minus 1 style computation, and then overall we have some for all quantifier, and then some more for all quantifiers beginning our pi k minus 1 computation. So we can put those um, for all quantifiers together and finally get a pi k minus 1 computation overall. Okay, so that's a tool we'll use. If we ever manage to get uh, this kind of result, which is the sort of thing that we're getting out of our, our lemmas, uh, or the conclusions of our, our proofs, um, we can use them in, in further proofs uh, to eliminate quantifiers. Okay, so that's alternation elimination. That's the easier uh, ingredient. The more interesting ingredient is what we've been calling alternation trading. And what we saw before in alternation trading is the following. Suppose you have some deterministic time-space uh, machine, so maybe it uses time t and space s simultaneously. And, you know, we were generally thinking of s being um, very small, so n to the little o of 1. And in that case, we saw that we could take any computation in this class uh, and put it into sigma 2 time basically square root t, or pi 2 times square root t. And what I want to show you right now is a generalization of this that allows us uh, an even better speed up at the expense of more alternations. Okay, so we'll be able to see that with sigma 3 time, uh, sorry, with a sigma-3 style machine, we can do a computation uh, for this time-space class in time t to the one-third, basically, and so forth. So let's look again at how we proved this alternation trading result. We uh, imagined a time-space computation with time t and space s, and it had some computation tableau, which basically had width order s, and that had height order t, Okay, the way the um, alternation trading worked is that we guessed, using existential quantifiers, some intermediate configuration. So these row headers are configurations. And we guessed some intermediate ones, uh, maybe R, CR, two, C2R, C3R, and so forth. So every, let's say, Rth uh, configuration, where R is a parameter. That was the first step. So we used uh, existential guessing to guess these space S configurations where r is a parameter to be chosen later. Okay, and the, the time for this piece is um, t over r. Well, it's big O of t over r. That's the number of configurations we're guessing, times s, because s is the size of the configuration we need to guess. Okay, so we guess these intermediate configurations. Then we use our for all guessing, our for all quantifiers, to just simply guess a, a j. And that's going to allow us to essentially check over um, all t over r are these configurations that they follow from the previous configuration. Okay, so the last stage of the sigma 2 computation in our old proof was like a deterministic stage where we simply checked that the uh, configuration j minus 1 times r indeed yielded configuration jr in r steps. And we simply did this by deterministic simulation. Okay, and this 
uh, stage of the computation, the deterministic stage, takes uh, order r time. And the for all guessing of, guessing of j takes very little time, logarithmic time, so we can ignore it. Okay. So uh, putting these ingredients together gave us a simulation of the time space TS class that was a uh, sort of sigma, uh, sorry, um, there exists for all time uh, order T over R times S plus R. Okay, and then we chose R to balance these two parameters, and that's how we got the root T root S uh, simulation. And I'd like to remind you, it's not completely obvious from the, the proof, but we can equally well have gotten a for all exists style computation with the same bound, and that's simply because uh, the time space class is deterministic, so it's close under comp complementation. So we can convert the there exists for all time result to a for all exists time result. Okay, so that's what we've seen so far, and now I'm going to tell you how you can improve upon this. Um, so the idea is quite simple, it's a natural one, it's to observe that, okay, in this, let's look back at here, the last stage of the computation, which I've starred, this deterministic, deterministic part of the computation. Well, here, we really need to just simulate a computation that uses space s and time r. So we kind of recursively reduce to the same problem, checking a time r space s computation. And so we could do that with um, a recursive application of the same idea. We could recursively do star. Uh, the idea being that the, it's you know a time space computation with time r and space s. Oops, uh, let me add a word here: computation. Okay, so for example, um, you know using this observation here, we can make this um, inner computation. Uh, for all exist style, okay, so um, we could, for example, make the this inner computation, which is a uh, sort of time space RS, we could make it for all exists time, and now, uh, well, instead of introducing another parameter, I'll simply remember the the final version of our original alternation trading uh, result, which was that uh, time space RS is a subset of uh, for all for all exists time uh, root R root S. Okay, and we can also make this exist for all time root R root S. So let me just write this over here. Okay, so if we make the inner computation that's checking this star um, in this way, then what do we get? The overall outer com the entire computation has a for all has a there exists up here and then it has this for all and then it has this for all and it has this for the exists and what is the overall time well we still get uh, this time up here so t over r times s plus but instead of having the plus r for the deterministic checking, we can use this result here. It's sort of the new version of star. Uh, we get root r root s. Okay, and we're still leaving r as a parameter here. So, you know, what I hope I've convinced you of here is that, in general, uh, time space t comma s is also a subset of this class here. Okay, by replacing the inner computation with another recursive application of the same idea. Of course, we can merge these two quantifiers. So to write this another way, it's sigma three time uh, t over r times s plus square root r square root s. Okay, and now we have a different balancing act with our r. If we balance these two uh, quantities by choosing r appropriately, um, it's not hard to check that the best choice of r is essentially t to the two thirds times s to the one third. I'll let you check that. Okay, and with this choice, um, what does this become? It becomes uh, sigma three time uh, t to the one third s to the two thirds. Okay, so what I'm telling you is we've finally shown this result, that the time space class uh, ts 
is a subset of sigma 3 time t to the 1 third s to the 2 thirds. Okay, and a particular corollary of this is if s is you know, very small, which is the main case we think about, t to the little of 1, then it's a subset of sigma 3 time, that's a 3, uh, t to the 1 third plus a little of 1. Okay, so as I promised before, if you're willing to go up to sigma 3, you can make the time like t to the 1 third. Okay, you get a 1 third savings and speed up. Of course, again, time space class is closed under complement, so we could also make this sigma 3 a pi 3 if we wanted, by taking the co of both sides. And I expect you'll believe me now uh, if I tell you you can keep iterating this argument and do the uh, even the inner computation, the inner recursive computation, you can do its deterministic part using another round of quantification. You can always carefully arrange your existent for alls in such a way um, that you do the most innermost computation with the quantifier exists for all that's just outside it, one level up in the recursion, so that you can always merge one quantifier to get little savings. So, uh, long story short, it's not hard for you to convince yourself that by more iterations of this argument, we can get the following general result. Uh, this is a theorem for all uh, time and space constructible T and S. The deterministic time space class TS is a subset of sigma k time uh, T to the 1 over k. That's the main thing. If you want to continue to keep track of the space, it's times uh, space s to the k minus 1 over k. That's, let me try to write that more clearly. k minus 1 over k. Okay, and you can also put pi k here if you want by closure under complementation. As I said, the main way that we're going to use this is just that uh, the time space class t and t to the little of 1 space is a subset of sigma k time t to the 1 over k plus little o of 1. Okay, and this is also true for pi k. Okay, so that's the way to soup up the alternation trading argument. And now we officially have all the ingredients that um, ever get used in these time-space trade-off results. Uh, we have alternation uh, trading, which is a sophisticated ingredient, alternation elimination, which combines padding uh, as well, which is relatively straightforward. And all of the time-space trade-offs for SAT that are known uh, involve simply putting these two ingredients together in cleverer and cleverer ways, and ultimately deriving a com uh, contradiction with the no complementary speed-up theorem. Okay, so now the next thing I'll show you is a quite clever way to do it, which will give us a time-space trade-off for SAT, showing that SAT requires time something like n to the 1.66 if it has sublinear space. Great, so now I'd like to revisit one more time the proof we've seen uh, a couple times that gets us a uh, time lower bound that's close to n to the root 2, and we'll see how to generalize it to something better than n to the root 2. Okay, so to recap one more time the old arguments, uh, we assume for the sake of contradiction that uh, non-deterministic time n is a subset of the time space class n to the c, n to the little o of 1, where c is a parameter we'll choose later. And we start the whole argument by looking at um, pi 2 time n. Okay, and the first step is to use um, alternation elimination uh, with together with the thing we assumed for contradiction. So uh, that allows us to get rid of the there exists part of the computation, the pi 2 time on the left, and we get this down to pi 1 time n to the c. That's alternation elimination together with the uh, assumption. And then we use the assumption again, or rather the co of the assumption to get this down, whoops, to get this down to uh, the deterministic time space class n to the c squared with n to the little o of 1 space. Okay, and that also uses a little bit of padding. Okay, and now we use the elimination, sorry, the alternation trading argument 
to take this back up to sigma 2 time uh, while saving a factor of 2 in the exponent so of the running time. So n to the c squared over 2 plus a little o of 1 time in uh, on a sigma 2 machine. Okay, that's alternation trading. And that's the end of the argument in case c is smaller than root 2. Okay, so you see at this point, if c squared over 2 uh, is less than 1, then we have a contradiction. Uh, so that gives us our old argument. Now let's figure out what we should do if c squared over 2 is greater than 1. So in this case, we don't have a contradiction. But as I mentioned, we do have a lemma. So we'll call the above a lemma. The fact that we have some kind of speed up, pi 2 time n, is a subset of sigma 2 time n to the c squared over 2. We'll call that a lemma and keep going. Okay, so this is exactly the sort of um, lemma. This lemma is exactly the sort of thing that we can use in alternation elimination arguments to get rid of quantifiers at the expense of making the time go up. Okay, so let's how we can see how we can use this lemma. So to use it, I'm going to again start out an argument by looking at sigma 3 time n. Okay, and the first thing I'm going to do is use the lemma to get rid of sort of the interior pi 2 part of this sigma 3 time uh, algorithm. So we're going to use the alternation elimination result and the lemma to get sigma 3 time n down to sigma 2 time n to the c squared over 2 plus the low of 1. Okay, that's the lemma together with alternation elimination. Not the best writing of elimination. I guess it's not important, but here we go. Okay, so now we're at sigma two time, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, get sigma two time down to deterministic a time space class. So what I'm going to use here is this connection here. Let me call that connection uh, happy face. Okay, so uh, this connection, this argument we've already seen, shows that you can take pi 2 time n and put it in uh, TISP n to the c squared. Of course, I can take the complement of that result uh, and get sigma 2 time n down to time space n to the c squared n to the little o of 1. And finally, I can also pad that to handle sigma 2 time n to the c squared over 2. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is I can get this all down to the time space class n to the c squared to the c squared over 2 plus little o of 1 comma n to the little o of 1. Okay, and what I've done here is uh, I've used happy face, or rather the co of happy face, and also padding. Great, so that's uh, the time space class c to the fourth over 2. Okay, and now if you can guess where this is going, um, I want to try to get a, a contradiction soon. So what I'm going to do is speed up this time-space computation using alternation trading and speed it up to a pi 3 computation. Okay, so I'm going to speed this up to pi 3 time something. And what happens when I speed that up? Well, um, from the alternation, the generalized alternation trading argument that we saw, uh, I can do that by multiplying the, the exponent of the running time by one third. Okay, so finally I'll get n to the c to the 4 over 6 plus a little o of 1 pi 3 time. Okay, and that's like the k equals 3 version of alternation trading. And I took this up to pi 3 time so that I would get potentially a contradiction with the no complementary speed up theorem. So you see now, if you take a look at what I've managed to prove here, if c to the fourth over six is less than one, we get a contradiction to the no complementary speed up time Harky theorem. Okay, and that's actually better than what we had before. That gives us something better than the square root two result because, well, this is when c is less than six to the power of one fourth, which I'll just tell you is 1.56 something. Okay, so we get a contradiction, and this shows that, you know, sat 
is not contained in TISP n to the 1.56 and to the little o of 1. And just for future reference, uh, a bit of a spoiler, I'm going to mention that the 6 to the 1 quarter can be written as 2 to the 1 quarter times 3 to the 1 quarter. Okay, so that's great. That got our time space lower bound up from n to the 1.41 to n to the 1.56. But you can see that we can get greedy here. I mean, here we kind of got our results by looking at level 3 of the hierarchy. Like, let's go up to level 4. So, what will happen if we do that? Again, as I said, if, uh, or as in the last argument, if c to the fourth over six is greater than or equal to one, we don't get a contradiction, but we do get, let's say, a new lemma. Okay, and we can try to exploit that lemma in another stage of the argument. So I'll show you what that looks like. So unsurprisingly, for the next stage of the argument, we start with sigma four time n. Okay, and um, we use this lemma that sigma 3 time n is contained in pi 3 time n to the c to the fourth over 6. Okay, and that lets us by elimination, alternation elimination, get rid of one quantifier here. And we can conclude that this is a subset of sigma 3 time um, n to the c to the fourth over 6 plus a little low of 1. These little of ones collect up everywhere. I might eventually stop writing them. Okay, so that's um, our new lemma. And again, alternation elimination. Great. Now, actually, um, there's a couple of ways to proceed at this point. If you know, I was asking you, what should I do next? Um, there's actually several different suggestions you could make at this point. Uh, some of which, some suggestions which actually don't lead to an improved bound. So I'll just directly tell you the move that does lead to uh, an improved bound. The thing that leads to an improved bound is the following. Let me go back up here to our uh, argument about sigma three time and look how it began. Okay, let me look at this, just this one inclusion here, which I'll call um, heart. Okay, so. Hart shows that uh, sigma three time can be sped up to sigma two time at the expense of paying a c squared over two in the exponent. Okay, and I would like to uh, use that fact uh, to speed up this sigma three argument, the sigma three class here. Okay, so um, what I'm actually going to use is uh, alternation elimination again. Okay, I'm going to use um, effectively the, the co of heart, pi three time n contained in pi, uh, pi two time n to the c squared over two, plus padding to get that up to n to the c to the fourth over six, to show the following. Uh, this, let me get heart back on the screen here is a subset of sigma two time, uh, basically n to the c to the six over 12, plus a little of one. Okay, so again, what happened there? Uh, I used alternation elimination and padding I guess padding is part of alternation elimination. So basically I use alternation elimination. Great. Okay, so now we have uh, sigma two time n to the six over 12, sorry, n to the c to the six over 12. And uh, what's the next step? Uh, the next step is basically happy face. Do you remember happy face? It's up here. Uh, happy face tells us how to take a, a pi two class or a sigma two class and use our very, very, very basic original assumption, this guy, twice, to get it down to a time space class at the expense of uh, replacing n by n to the c squared. Okay, so I'm going to use happy face again, or the co of happy face, I suppose, way down here. So it's by co of happy face. Uh, okay, to get this into uh, what, the time space class n 
Okay, so uh, basically in happy face, C goes, uh, sorry, N goes to N to the C squared. Okay, so when I do N going to N to the C squared, this becomes C to the eighth over 12. I still have this plus the law of one kicking around. And the space in these time space classes is always N to the law of one. Okay, good. And what's the final step? The final step is always alternation trading. At least that's the final step in this line of argumentation. So again, we use the alternation trading argument to boost this to a much faster result in sigma four time. Okay, and what, uh, what do we get? We can divide the exponent on n by four if we go up to sigma four, sorry, up to pi four time. So this becomes n to the c to the eight over 48 plus little o of one. That's alternation trading. Great, and that's the end of this segment of the argument. Okay, let's uh, reap what we can out of this. So once again, if the exponent here is less than one, so c to the eight over 48 is less than one, we get a contradiction and we go home pretty happy. And what do we get? We got, this is equivalent to c being less than um, 48 to the power of one eighth, which again, for future reference, I will note happens to be two to the one quarter times three to the one eighth times four to the one eighth. And that's about, um, according to my notes, something like 1.62. Great, so that gives us an even better result. We got a contradiction and we got that, if we go way back up, I'll show you that n time n is uh, not a subset of time space class n to the 1.62 and to the little o of one. Okay, but we can keep going, obviously. Um, well, believe it or not, let me do it one more time. So, uh, otherwise, if c to the eighth over 48 is greater than or equal to one, we have a new lemma and we keep going. We sit with, uh, we start with sigma five time at, okay. And we use the, uh, lemma we just proved about sigma four time n uh, being contained in pi four time n with the slowdown of n to the c to the eight over 48 to do elimination, uh, alternation elimination one more time. So this becomes uh, sigma four time n to the g c to the eight over 48 plus the law of one. And then what do we do? We use alternation uh, elimination again to get, okay, we get it down to sigma three time uh, n to the, let's see, how do we do this? Even I'm confusing myself here. So we have sigma four time and right. So sigma four time n can be put in uh, sigma three time at the expense of getting uh, n to the c to the fourth over six. Okay, so that'll put this up to c to the 12th over whatever six times 48 is, plus the low of one. Okay, and great. So then again, get this down to sigma two time how do we do that? Uh, yes, that's a uh, heart. So that gains us another c squared over two in the power. So that puts this up to n to the c to the 14 over whatever six times 48 times two is, plus the of one. Phew, okay. And uh, right, now we do the same trick that's in the square root two result. So we apply the base assumption twice and get this down to the time space class and to the, that gains us a C squared. So C to the 16 over six times 48 times two uh, plus a little of one and the space is n to the little of one. Okay, phew.
And then we use alternation trading to bring this up to, oops, not sigma, we bring it up to pi five time. Uh, we get to divide by five in the exponent, so n to the power of c to the 16 over six times 48 times two times five, plus a little of one, phew. And this is a contradiction if that exponent is less than one. And let me just say that occurs, take my word for it, if c is less than uh, two to the one quarter times three to the one eighth times four to the one over 16 times five to the one over 16. You can check that, which is 1.645. Okay, and obviously, I hope by now you've got the gist of everything, it's got the drift, so if you keep iterating this and iterating this, uh, you can get slightly larger, oops, time bounds. And what time bounds do you get? The limit of what you get by this method is two to the one quarter times three to the one eighth times four to the one sixteenth, that's a sixteen. Uh, times five to the one over 32, times six to the one over 64, etc. And that is something like 1.66. Okay, so the final limit of this strategy, this crazy strategy of trading off our ingredients, alternation, elimination, alternation, um, trading, is that sat is not contained in, sorry, the time space class, n to the 1.66 something uh, and little o of n to the little of one space. All right, so time for the denouement of this lecture. Uh, we've gotten our lower bound up to n to the 1.66, which is pretty good. It's not the best thing that's known, as I mentioned at the beginning. It can even be gotten up to n to the 1.8. And the argumentation gets more elaborate. elaborate. Let me just tell you uh, how to go from here, how to start making improvements even above this n to the 1.66. Um, if you take a look back at our proof, in some sense we used uh, the ingredients in the sharpest possible way the most of the time, but there is one stage, which is actually this stage, which recurs in every part of the argument where we didn't use the ingredients in the most optimal way, at least potentially. So this is where we went down from sigma two time something to a deterministic time space class with a slowdown. And we did that even in the original n to the 1.41 argument, when we used the um, uh, basic assumption, this one, twice. Okay, we use it, well here it's done with pi two, but it's the same with sigma two. Here we use it once, and here we use it twice. And uh, the second time we use it, we use it in its full generality, or we use it in its full strength, but let me highlight here this one, okay? So this one here, um, we didn't actually use the full strength of the assumption that we're trying to contradict. We did a, a alternation elimination once here, but this part only used that n time n is a subset of time n to the c, deterministic time n to the c. It did not use the fact that you could also make this low space. So there's a bit of slack here where we didn't use every ingredient we had to its maximum potential. And that is the place where you start um, hacking if you want to improve the, the result that we have so far n to the 1.66. Um, so, in fact, in the Williams 2007 PhD thesis, he actually kind of codified all possible proofs that are in the style that we've done. So he codified sort of all possible um, proof strategies that you could use that um, involved uh, the ingredients that we've seen. So like the basic assumption that you're trying to contradict, and then um, alternation uh, elimination, and alternation trading, 
and I suppose padding as well. And um, finally ending with contradiction to the no complementary speed up hierarchy theorem. Okay, so these are the four ingredients that are used in all uh, proofs, even up to Williams's n to the 1.8 or n to the 2 cos pi over 7 proof. And in fact, you've kind of found that one um, kind of experimentally with computer experimentation uh, by sort of looking through all proof strategies that involved combining these ingredients in every possible way. And um, this is actually how, you know, using these things, how he found the, as I said, he found the uh, proof that uh, n time n is not a subset of uh, TISP n to the c, n to the little of 1, for all c less than 2 cos pi over 7. And in fact, in his PhD thesis, he conjectured that um, this funny number is actually the limit of uh, this method, if you will. So he conjectured that any proof strategy that involved like mixing these ingredients in any complicated way, any inductive way, any way of ordering them, it could never achieve a bound that was better than this uh, n to the 2 cos pi over 7. And that was actually subsequently proven by, uh, so as I said, this was conjectured optimal among all uh, proof strategies of this type. Sort of, this is, gives like a proof system. And this was proven, his conjecture was proven by himself and uh, Sam Buss in 2011. Okay, so what they showed is that if you want to try to beat this n to the 1.8, uh, you're going to have to use some new ingredient that does not appear on this uh, list of ingredients. Okay, That was also a little bit surprising because people had this feeling that, oh, it'll probably get up to anything less than n squared if we just keep working harder and harder. And they showed that surprisingly, um, no, 2 cos pi over 7 is the limit of this method. Okay, let me tell you one more thing uh, before this lecture ends. And uh, it's the following. You might ask, well, perhaps I can improve these ingredients. Um, and really, there's one, only one ingredient that you could sort of imagine trying to improve, and it's alternation trading. Okay, so alternation elimination, it's kind of straightforward. There's not a lot else you could imagine doing. But alternation trading is kind of like the, the powerful proof ingredient. And so you might wonder, you know, is it possible, oops, is it possible to get something better? So alternation trading tells us that um, uh, the TISPN n to the little of 1 complexity class is a subset of, uh, let's say, sigma k time uh, n to the 1 over k plus little o of 1. And you might imagine uh, asking, can that be better? Okay, Is it possible that, let's say, uh, this class is contained in uh, sigma 3 time um, something even smaller than n to the 1 third? So, I don't know, n to the 1 fourth or n to the point 3. And the answer is that this is actually not improvable. This is provably not improvable. Okay, and this was observed by uh, Williams. And uh, why is this the case? Well, I'll tell you why it's the case. I won't prove it, but it'll motivate something we'll prove later in this course. So um, Williams made the following observation. Uh, first of all, the language called parity, which is literally an extremely simple language. It's all strings x such that the Hamming weight of x is odd. Okay, this extremely simple language is in uh, the time-space class uh, linear time and constant space. Uh, I mean, you just have to go through the bits and add them up. Wait, I suppose not constant space. you got to add up... Uh, no, yeah, constant space. You just have to <laughs> keep one bit, keep track of if you've seen an even or odd number of bits as you go along. Um, However, and I can actually, I believe, leave this as an exercise for you. Any language in sigma k time n to the alpha um, has circuits uh, with depth k plus 1 and size uh, 2 to the order, uh, basically, n to the alpha. Maybe you have to put a k here, but n to the alpha. So exponential in n to the alpha, 
um, size circuits of depth k plus 1. Okay, and this is really like a problem you've seen a couple times in your homework about converting alternating uh, time classes of the polynomial time hard key into exponential size circuits. Okay, so um, in particular, um, if you could improve upon this alternation trading relationship, then parity, which is in the class on the left, would have um, that k plus 1 circuits of size smaller than exponential in n to the 1 over k. But this is, um, without any assumptions, known to be false. So this is a famous circuit lower bound due to Hostad, actually proved in his PhD thesis from 1986, or 84, somewhere around the mid 80s. Uh, and this is a, a famous circuit lower bound that we'll prove later in this course. So he showed that any uh, depth k plus 1 circuit, okay, and these are all um, circuits with unbanded Fanon, ands, and ors, uh, computing the language parity needs size that's exponential in um, n to the 1 over k. Okay, and so that circuit lower bound that we'll see later shows that uh, this alternation trading result cannot be fundamentally improved. And therefore, if we want to improve on these time space lower bounds for SAT, uh, then we'll really, really need some new ingredients that we haven't seen before.